Playing Path of Radiance again after nearly a decade is both a trip down memory lane and a whole new adventure. While I kind of remember the gameplay and story, I knew next to nothing about its characters. So diving into Path of Radiance supports for basically the first time has been pretty refreshing. For those who don't follow me on Twitter, I've started to play FE9 again because I'm working on a new support science video for Ike, but because of the insane amount of writing in this game and its slow pace, it's been taking a while. So in the meantime, I thought it would be interesting to start a new support conversation series, one in which I simply pick four support conversations at random from one of the franchise's games with support conversations and do an analysis and review of whatever I pick. Since Path of Radiance is my flavor of the week, I decided that the grand opening of the Support Mixer should showcase what random supports this game has to offer. So with that out of the way, let's get started on random selection number one. Janaf and Shinon. These two characters are pretty fun and interesting. Shinon is a late 20 something year old racist asshole who left the Greal mercenaries after he died and when Ike inherited the company. After speaking with Rolf and being defeated by Ike in battle, Shinon returned to the Crimean side of the war. Janaf is a Phoenician retainer to King Tabarn. He, unlike his counterpart Ulki, is outspoken and somewhat juvenile, but is no doubt a formidable fighter. Given that one is an outspoken racist towards Laguz and the other is kind of a spitfire, the sea support is comedically predictable, for lack of a better term. Their sea support begins with Janaf approaching Shinon and telling him to halt. Shinon asks who he is, but Janaf responds by questioning him about where he comes from and what position he's in the army. Shinon dismisses Janaf's questioning and calls him an ignorant half-breed. Janaf calls him a jerk in response and they go back and forth until they both walk away from one another, not before getting in some last second digs. Their sea support, like I said, is predictable, but that is by no means bad. Shinon is basically the only playable character that is not only a dick, but is openly racist towards his own peers. While Shinon's attitude towards Lagoos are par for the course, that's what makes them interesting. For me, it adds intrigue as to how this support will play out. Will Shinon come out of this A support with a better understanding of Lagoos culture? Or will the writers pull a Nino and Lagolt situation where their relationship actually gets worse after their A support? Their B support starts with the two crossing paths and exchanging more insults to one another. But after Janaf mentions Greel in a bad light, Shinon gets very upset, nearly to the point of attacking him. His outburst towards Janaf perplexes him, and it prompts him to ask what Shinon is even doing here if the only person he respects is dead. Shinon answers that he fights merely to make a living. This discovery leads to a bit of common ground being made between the two as Janaf learns a bit more about how humans behave, but of course it ends with a couple more insults being hurled to one another. Janaf's understanding of humans gets slightly changed after hearing what Shinon's motivations are, and leads Janaf to finding some sort of common decency from Shinon which prompts him to become more intrigued about Bjork relationships in general as well. On the flip side, Shinon seems to indicate that he understands Janaf's culture a bit more too. I also appreciate Shinon's passion about protecting Greel's integrity. It's clear that Shinon cares about being here, and he's not just here messing around, despite what some soldiers around the camp might think. In their A support, Janaf approaches Shinon and apologizes to him, admitting that he misunderstood Bjork culture and made off-color presumptions about them. Shinon asks why Janaf even joined the army in the first place, or if it was just because Tabarn said to. Janaf explains to him that his responsibility is to Prince Raisin, and admits to liking and trusting Ike for saving him. Shinon chuckles at his feelings towards Ike, explaining that he's always hated Ike since he was spoiled and takes everything for granted. Shinon then catches himself and then asks why he's revealing these details to Janaf. And then he tells Shinon that his attitude reminds him of his own when he was young. Afterwards, Janaf reveals to Shinon that he's just over 110 years old. It hits Shinon that he's talking to someone nearly 85 years older than him, and Janaf teases Shinon about him being a youngster. Very intrigued, Shinon stops him from leaving and asks him about his life experiences. This support is one of my favorite support conversations that I've read in Path of Radiance so far. Right from Janaf's apology, resulting in Shinon's stuttering in surprise, this support takes a positive turn. Notice the change in pronouns as well. No longer is Janaf calling humans humans, because in this universe, calling a Bjork a human is the equivalent to calling a Laguz a subhuman. At the same time, when Shinon discovers Janaf's age, he restrains himself from calling him a half-breed and opts for just referring to Laguz as those guys. Eyes. What the change in pronouns shows is a mutual respect for one another's race, and respect for each other after finding a common ground through actually having a normal conversation. It's funny, Shinon is even surprised that he's even conversing with a Laguz insult-free. 
The icing on the cake though, in my opinion, is Jenoff's use of the term young pup towards Shinon's youth. An expression that Shinon himself used against Ike in reference to his young age and inexperience. Shinon's entire character takes a complete 180, ending in him showing genuine interest in what Jenoff has to say, instead of shoving him away every time Jenoff had a concern about him. Overall, it's a fantastic support. It's comedic, layered, interesting, and engaging. I like all three of these supports greatly. Next up in the support mixer is the support between Ike and Titania. You all of course know Ike, the son of Greel, founder of the Greel Mercenaries, and Titania, a good friend and loyal mercenary to him, as well as being his primary advisor and teacher. Their sea support is pretty straightforward. Ike asks Titania to spar with him, but she's a bit surprised that Ike still needs her to teach him lessons. He responds by saying that while Grill taught him swordsmanship, Titania was integral to polishing up his style. The conversation transitions into Ike asking when she had met Grail for the first time, but she says it's a long story, and then quickly drops the subject so they can begin their sparring match. Titania's relationship with Greel up to this point has hinted at her feeling some type of way towards him. For instance, she's quick to jump to Greel's defense whenever any of the Greel mercenaries question him or his orders, and there is of course that cutscene showing Titania crying over Greel's death. The implication is that Titania has feelings for Greel that she tries to keep hidden away from Ike and the rest of the mercenaries. Their B support begins with Ike again asking about her past with Greel. Titania admits that it's difficult to talk about her past with him, but she begins to do so anyway for Ike's sake. She explains how, through an officer exchange program through Crimea and Gallia, she was stationed in Gallia and saw Greel for the first time. She describes how Greel was so completely and utterly out of every other Knight's League that he effortlessly took on wave after wave of them like they were total chumps. Titania gave it a shot herself, but was dunked on too. But afterwards, she asked him to train her, and so whenever they both had free time, they would train together. Their bond developed through these sessions, and eventually Greel invited her to his home, where she met Ike as a baby being held by his mother, Alina. Titania then tells Ike, The commander looked at you with such kind eyes. I saw a different person than the man who wielded a sword. Aside from the story, there's really nothing noteworthy going on in their B support. It's honestly pretty boring in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, it's a nice story, but Ike doesn't have anything noteworthy to say in response to it. Titania tells Ike that she saw a different side of Greel, a side that Ike may have not gotten to see that often given how Greel is stern and strict most of the time. It was certainly a side of him that we as players never get to see at all, even throughout his time in the story. And the most Ike has to say to this story is, whoa, and I see. And if I were Titania, I can't help but wonder if I would be a little bit upset if all Ike had to say was tantamount to, well that's pretty cool. Sure, Ike is acting naturally here, but I find it boring. The A support begins with Ike approaching Titania and formally thanking her for all the work she's done for Greel since the death of Alina. Ike admits that he's taken everything in his life for granted, but it was all possible because Titania made his life as easy as it was up till now. She tries to respond to this, but Ike cuts her off and asks her if she loved him. She doesn't say no, but Ike continues. I stand here alive today because of you, and I still want to thank you for it. Had you not lent a helping hand, I would most likely be dead, and my father's life cut short as well. You helped to keep him alive until the Black Knight brought him down. You made his final years happy. Thank you. This is easily the best part about their support chain, and we discover that Titania seemed to have saved Greel from himself. It's bittersweet as Titania begins to cry, perhaps from simply grief or a kind of vindication through Ike thanking her, but she definitely makes this support one to remember. Titania is just about the only thing that makes this support chain interesting. The subject matter of the C and B feels irrelevant compared to their A that I wish they just went in another direction entirely with those first two support conversations. Now, that's not to say that disjointed supports are bad. Elliewood and Hector have disconnected support conversations too, but the difference between Elliewood and Hector, and Titania and Ike, is that those two have chemistry whereas these two don't really have any. Ike's lack of reaction or emotion to this story that clearly affects Titania comes off like these two may as well be strangers. Ike's lack of interesting dialogue from most of this support chain is indicative of his major writing issue in his supports. He tends to never have anything interesting to say. And just so you don't misinterpret what I'm saying here, I don't mean he doesn't have anything interesting to say because he's quiet by nature, I literally mean he's just really boring as a character and doesn't have a lot of chemistry with many of his support partners. 
I'll talk about this more in his support science, so I suppose this breakdown is a bit of a teaser for one of my arguments or something. On the flip side, Titania's importance to Ike is what really gets revealed, and her romantic feeling towards Greel matches how often she actually dwells on Greel's death. There's a cutscene in Path of Radiance towards the late game where Ike begins to explain what actually happened in the Galleon forests the night Greel was killed, and Titania, surprised that he never told her, starts to press Ike about what he knows and literally yells at him that she needs to know. Overall, while the support helps flesh out Titania by giving her backstory, I wasn't impressed. Mostly because Ike has a boring personality and is at his best when he's physically doing something so his actions speak louder than his words, but that doesn't lend all that well to his support since he's not actually doing anything in them. His emotional range is naturally small. And whether or not the writers intended this, I shouldn't feel like Titania cares more about Greel than Ike does, but I do. Anyways, that was the Titania and Ike support, let's move on to the next pair, Oscar and Tanith. Oscar is a cavalier in service of the Greel mercenaries and is both well-spoken and well-mannered. This is due to him being a former Crimean knight before he stepped down to take care of his brothers, Boyd and Rolf. He became a mercenary after Greel himself gave him the job, and Tanith is a commander of Bengyon's army and is assigned by Apostle Sanaki to bolster the Crimean army's limited numbers. Oscar and Tanith's sea support begins with her picking up a cloth that Oscar had accidentally dropped. She picks it up and hands it over to him. Oscar introduces himself as a mercenary under Ike, and Tanith is surprised that a mercenary could be so courteous and well-mannered. She begins to explain her own position in the army, as she is a newer member to the party, and Oscar tells her how it's an honor to have such an esteemed group of Benyon warriors join the effort. After he leaves, she briefly muses over his behavior, saying she never expected a mercenary to behave like such a gentleman. For a sea support, this one is pretty interesting. Tenneth has an impression of mercenaries being these loudmouth pigs who will try to do any dirty deed for coin. Shinon, in other words, but is pleasantly surprised at how Oscar carries himself. Aside from his hilarious and endearing support with Janaf, in which he entirely breaks his character out of nervousness around him, Oscar is pretty par for the course in terms of behavior for a cavalier. There's not much character to him aside from his manners, lightly touched on backstory, and passion to cook in Path of Radiance, but using his personality as a medium to drive an event of surprise for Tanith is a refreshing way to use what little Oscar has to offer. Now on to their B support. This B support is caked with interesting dialogue about clashing perspectives on honor. On one hand, Tanith believes that honor lies in fighting head to head, going all in no matter what the consequences. Anything less than a direct assault would be dishonorable in the Begnyon war culture. On the flip side, Oscar states his own case on honor. His perspective is basically that honor isn't worth dying over, that it's better to withdraw and to survive to fight another day. While both individuals have different perspectives on battle, they both agree that these differing perspectives have a lot to do with context. Tanith can afford to fight the way she does because Bangnon has a massive army that has dispensable soldiers. On the flip side, Oscar is fighting with a very undermanned force that can't afford to be blinded by honor and lose soldiers because of it. Both of these perspectives make complete sense. Furthermore, finding more common ground while also contributing to the world building of Tellius is a treat. On a more personal level, Tanith is once again pleasantly surprised at Oscar's behavior, now admitting her shattered expectations of a mercenary to Oscar directly. It's a little bit difficult to tell if they're both being nice to each other, or Tanith is legitimately flirting with Oscar towards the end of their B support. Or both. I suppose it's mostly up to interpretation, but whether it is flirting or not, these two have chemistry. In their A support, Tanith catches up to Oscar on his way to prepare dinner and thanks him for sharing his insights with her, and that she's learned so much that she wishes she could bring him back to Bangyon to share the wealth. She also happens to be pleasantly surprised that Oscar can cook as well. He explains that the mercenary life demands that everyone has jobs to do. Tanith mentions that she actually sucks at cooking, but then Oscar offers to teach her some lessons and she accepts the offer. In my opinion, the chemistry in this support is bouncing all over. What was once up to interpretation in B are definite advances on both characters now. In Fire Emblem, a line similar to, take you to my country with me, tends to be code for, let's get married after this. Similarly, Oscar's delivery when he offers her to teach her cooking lessons, given the context, seem to be subtle advances. Of course, Radiant Dawn exists, so pairings are impossible anyway, but still, if this were any other game, I'm sure these two would end up together. 
Overall, I'm a fan of this support. Oscar's fairly typical social life behavior and mercenary background complement each other greatly because Teneth knows little about that lifestyle aside from what she assumes a mercenary to be. They have chemistry right from the get-go that really make these three support conversations seem natural and ultimately fun to read. In my opinion, it's a good support. The final support for this support mixer of Path of Radiance is Tormod and South. Tormod is a mage from Bagnon who was raised by Muaram in the desert. He's a cocky and headstrong kid with a passion for his Lagu's friends and to free them from slavery. And little Soth here is a thief who snuck onto Nazir's ship heading to Bagnon and was given permission to stay from Ike. Their sea support begins with Tormod approaching Soth and complimenting him on his sneaky tactics during one of their battles. It takes a while for Soth to actually give Tormod his name, and after Tormod asks him why he's working as a mercenary, Soth shuts him down and walks off and the conversation ends there. Tormod's loud and enthusiastic presence clashes strongly with Soth's much more edgy, quiet, and standoffish personality. The sea support is pretty short and basic enough to understand. Tormod is trying to befriend someone his age, but Soth doesn't want to be his friend. Their B support starts with Tormod again trying to get Soth to warm up to him. After saying they should be friends, Soth straight up rejects him. However, Tormod doesn't let up, but Soth calls him insane and walks off again. Yeah, not a whole lot to discuss here. In fact, this support chain seems like a pretty archetypical one to have in the franchise. There's Rutger and Ferg, Karel and Guy, you know, the edgy guy and the guy who's trying to be friends with the edgy guy. The dynamic between Soth and Tormod isn't anything new to the franchise. Soth is just a lone wolf. That said, I think context makes me appreciate this particular case a bit more because unlike those pairs mentioned from the other games, Soth and Tormod are just young boys. And Soth is just a thief, not some bloodthirsty sword slinger. For me, it's easy to imagine Soth thinking he's just too cool for Tormod or something. But what is new, and something unique to Path of Radiance and their support system, is found in their A support. In A, Tormod greets Soth as his friend, but Soth tells him to give it up. After refusing to, Soth asks why he's so determined to make friends with him. Tormod answers that it's because of Muaram. If Muaram is alive, their conversation goes as follows. Well, he looks sad every time I see him. He thinks it's his fault that I don't have any Bjork friends. That's why I wanted you to be my friend, to make him feel better. But if Muaram is dead, Tormod instead says this. Well, back when he was alive, he used to worry about me not having any Bjork friends. That's why I wanted you to be my friend, to honor his memory. The explanation makes sense to Soth, and he empathizes with Tormod. He finds a common ground with Tormod because he too has someone who was like a parent to him. Afterwards, their friendship starts to actually go somewhere. But Soth is still reluctant and cold, explaining that thieves are loners and he can't have Tormod stick around with him and ruining his sneaky tactics. The boys find common ground to walk on as they both have parental figures that they are thankful for, and he understands why Tormod wants to honor Muaram. The truly cool thing about this support is the actual use of a conditional within it. While minor and ultimately not changing the direction of their friendship, a couple lines changing dependent on Muaram being alive is refreshing. In fact, Path of Radiance did this more than once. There's conditionals between McAuliffe and Astrid in their A support, and Mist and Jills is even more complicated. As a support relative to the others that goes on in Path of Radiance, it's really not that interesting of a support in the end, but I do appreciate the extra mile the writers go for Tormod. Well guys, that will do it for the first ever support mixer. From what I've seen so far, supports in Path of Radiance are very good and there hasn't been many that I straight up dislike so far. Next time on this series, I'm going to be drinking to some sacred stones and I'll be picking 4 supports at random to analyze and review just like in this video. If you enjoyed this video, please slap a like and leave some feedback down in the comments. And if you're new and like what you see, please subscribe. Well that'll do it for me here, I'm Gas and I'll catch you guys next time. Deuces.